you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 is where we'll be at tonight. We're going to continue our series on the uh, seven churches of Asia. Uh, and tonight we're going to be talking about the church at Pergamum. And that's in Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. We want to remind ourselves, of course, about uh, the, the churches that are in, written here in Revelation, written to here in Revelation. These seven churches in uh, chapters 2 and 3 are undergoing uh, extreme persecution. They're having uh, a difficult time, uh, much probably much more severe persecution uh, than than we are experiencing. And we see uh, in this uh, the reaction from these seven churches uh, gives us a, an idea of, of the totality of the possible reaction. Some of them uh, have absolutely nothing negative said about them and, and they're, they're, they're praised for the good things that they're doing. And some of them have absolutely nothing good about them and they're condemned for the things that they're not doing right. But most of them, just like most people who claim to be Christians, who are striving to be Christians, and most congregations that are striving to do uh, what God would have them to do, have some things that are good and some things that are bad. And that would be the case for our uh, the congregation we're talking about tonight, the church that's there in, in Pergamum. Uh, just a little bit about that city. I don't know how well the, the pictures are going to show up, but um, it, it's a, a beautiful city, an inland city, much different than the, the first two cities that we talked about, which were port cities, cities where uh, commerce and trade uh, would come into those from, uh, from the, uh, the western parts of the Roman Empire and, and be uh, brought there to, to travel to the, the eastern parts of the Roman Empire. This is a, an industrial city city, uh, a city of industry, a city of, of manufacturing, which is really in some ways just a, a stop along a busy highway. There's nothing uh, necessarily um, significant about, about this one uh, so much. You know, I'm, I'm actually thinking about a, a different city because I've already prepared next week's lesson. So there you go. Next week's lesson, when we talk about Thyatira, that's the uh, the industrial city. I'm sorry, but it is a beautiful city uh, set upon the the top of a hill. And if you can see that, I don't know how well it shows up there, but there is a, a lake there in the background uh, that, that it's a beautiful city. And you can maybe see the uh, the theater that is there. Uh, and there's a couple of other pictures here. This is what it would have uh, looked like. You have the the altar of Zeus and the agora, which is that that marketplace, like we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago in uh, the Athenian temple and a, a number of temples uh, that are here in this city. And that's an artist uh, rendition of what it would have been like. But uh, this was actually a, a center of religion. It was the first official capital of the Roman province of Asia. And even after Smyrna takes the, uh, the official capital ship uh, of the, the province of Asia, it's still the, the center for religion. There are many temples uh, many, many temples in this, uh, in this city of Pergamon. There are three temples to, to three different emperors. Uh, and there are multiple temples to uh, Greek, Egyptian, and Asian gods. Uh, there was a city that, that encouraged uh, the worship of, of a number of, of different gods. They had the, the altar of Zeus, and we've all heard of, uh, of Zeus before in our, our study of um, different uh, Greek mythology and that sort of thing. And this, this uh, altar was 120 feet long. 112 feet wide and some 20 feet high was one of the ancient wonders of the world. Uh, Pergamum gets its name uh, from a, the writing, one of the writing materials that was created. It had a library of some 200,000 volumes. It's the second largest library in the ancient world, second only to Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, so this was a, a place of, of reading, of education, of a study of, of different types of gods. Uh, it would be a, a place that... Uh, well, you may want to visit. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful place. It's a place where there, where there would be a lot of people. If you had lived during that time frame, uh, Pergamum would probably have been one of the places that you would have liked to have gone. Let's notice verse 12. Is this is the, the congregation. This is the city that the congregation uh, that is being written to, that's, that's the one that it's in. It says, unto the angel of the church of Pergamum write, The one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, so he reminds us of, first of all, Jesus speaking here, Jesus being the one who's delivering the message. What is it that he points out to remind the church, to remind the Christians there in Pergamum? He says, I'm the one with the sharp two-edged sword. And anytime, anytime in any part of Scripture, but certainly in Revelation, when there's symbolism, we want to look to other Scriptures that help us to understand what that symbolism is. And this one's pretty easy. When we think of the sharp two-edged sword, there are verses that talk about the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, that the Word of God is living in active and sharper than any two-edged sword. So we can recognize that this is talking about Jesus' message. This is talking about Jesus' authority uh, in some ways. We can look to Scripture in Ephesians, again, 
in Ephesians 6, 17 talks about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And, and here's, the, here's the, the, the point of that, the power of that. And piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. God is able to judge and judge always correctly because He can look at your thoughts and your intentions. He knows what you're thinking. He knows why you do the things that you do. So we can look to, uh, to Scripture to see what this sharp two-edged sword might mean to these Christians that are reading it. But we also need to look to the historical context. The city of Pergamum as the, one of the capitals or one of the original capitals of the, the province of Asia was one of only a few cities that could carry out and perform capital punishment uh, where you could be killed. And that would be recognized and perhaps even symbolized during Roman times by the sword. Uh, we've talked about in the past that denying the emperor or denying to, to worship the emperor was punishable by death. Uh, the point, I think, one of the points we can get from this when Jesus says, the one with the sharp two-edged sword... We can see that Rome isn't the only one with a sword. Rome isn't the only one that has the power to punish and punish uh, powerfully. Uh, so we can recognize the, the fact that uh, th those who would be reading in Pergamon will recognize not only the power of the word, but the authority of that word, the authority of the word to punish. In verses 13 and following, much like all of the other uh, scriptures, or all the other uh, messages to the churches so far that we've read, Jesus knows. Jesus knows everything. Jesus knows what's going on in these churches and in the lives of these Christians. Let's notice verse 13. What are some things that Jesus says that he knows? I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name, and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. So here are a couple of things that, that point out, that jump out to us, where Satan's throne is, and the verse ends with where Satan dwells. Does that mean that, that literally Satan's home on earth is, is there at Pergamum? No, that's not what it means. Is there literally a throne where, where Satan sits upon or, or even a throne where people worship Satan there? No, that's not what it means, of course. What it means is uh, that this city that is filled with all of these different gods is full of rampant evil. It is the center for worship of many uh, pagan gods and certainly the center for emperor worship during this time. And in the midst of this, these worships, uh, it was a very immoral worship. It wasn't worship like we have today. It wasn't worship even like uh, a lot of religions have today. Uh, uh, there, were, there was a, a sexual undertone in, in many of the, the, these temples. They had uh, temple priests and priestesses that would uh, participate in, in sexual acts in order to, to be a part of their worship. So even in their worship to their immoral gods, immorality reigned within that type of worship. Uh, Christians, ironically, during the first century and in Pergamum, Christians would be considered atheists uh, because they only believed in one God. Uh, if you didn't believe in, in many gods, it, basically if you didn't believe in, in any god that existed, you were considered to be an atheist. Uh, it's, it's, it's funny, it's, it sounds a lot different than the way that a lot of people think today. Uh, atheist today means we don't believe in any god. Well, atheist then means if you don't believe in every god, then you're, you're anti or you're against God. You're against these ideas of these different gods. So in some ways, the idea of coexisting was, was well and alive in the first century. You can believe in Zeus and you can believe in Athena and you can believe that the emperors are gods, but you can't believe in just one God because if you believe in just one God, then you're an atheist. You're against all of these other gods. And that would certainly be something that Christians in Pergamum would have to deal with. He says there, he praises them for holding fast his name. We talked last week, I believe, about emperor worship, and we defined what that is. Basically, all emperor worship was, and that's the, the worship of the emperors of Rome, was to go uh, to, to a fire where there was incense, or a fire where there was flame, to, to grab some, some incense, to throw those into the fire, and to proclaim Caesar as Lord. Uh, and we talked about how, how last week and in previous weeks, uh, the congregations, they, they stood firm against that. They decided... No, I'm not going to do that because I've already confessed that Christ is Lord, that Jesus is Lord. I'm going to hold fast to that confession. Uh, so here they're praised. The Christians at Pergamum are praised because they hold fast to his name even when someone dies for doing the same. The man's name here is, is Antipas. And we know nothing else about this man other than what it said here. Uh, he, other than what it says that uh, my, my servant, the, the faithful one, the, the faithful message, uh, when he was died, you still remained faithful. So in the midst of, of great persecution, the, the name Antipas means father. So it's possible 
Uh, that, that, could be his, that could literally be his name, or that could just be a description of, of who he is, a, a church father or a leader in the church perhaps. Uh, either, either way, uh, there was persecution and difficulty, and even when one of their members, perhaps one of their leaders, was killed for refusing to, to deny Christ, refusing to uh, offer worship to the emperor or maybe to any of these other gods... Uh, they still remained faithful. They still did the right thing. So Antipas is one of those unsung heroes of the Bible that we know very little about. Jesus calls him, again, a faithful witness. And if you look back to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, you'll notice that Jesus is described that way himself as a faithful witness. So we appreciate the, the great um, compliment that that is when Jesus says that about Antipas and that's said about Jesus himself earlier in the book. While Satan tries to undermine loyalty to Christ by persecution, Christ strengthens that loyalty through commendation. Uh, he knows. He knew Antipas. He, he knew about his death. He knew about uh, the fact that he was willing to stand for him in the face of, of possible death and even in death itself. And he commends the congregation for being faithful to him uh, even during this time. Let's notice verses 14 and 15. We have a reference here uh, back to some, some Old Testament scriptures and some Old Testament uh, individuals. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold to the teaching of Balaam, and who, keep on, who kept on teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who, in the same way, hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So here, a, a reference. So what's important about a reference? A reference has no meaning if you don't know who you're talking about, right? Uh, if I was to, uh, to use a, a sports analogy up here and, and you didn't know anything about the sport that I was talking about, it would mean very little to you, right? Uh, some of us might, might really catch on to that analogy or to that, that reference. But if the reference doesn't mean anything to you, then, then there's no power in it. Well, here these, these Christians in Pergamon, they would be familiar with the Old Testament character, the Old Testament individual called Balaam. Balaam is a, a Mesopotamian soothsayer. Uh, he is hired by Balak. Balak is the, the king of Moab. Uh, he's hired to curse the Israelites. You can read about all this in Numbers chapter 22 and following. Uh, the Israelites here have been wandering around the, the wilderness for 40 years or so, and they've come to uh, the plains of Moab, opposite the city of Jericho. They're, they're right there. They're about to enter into the promised land. Moses is still alive at this point, but very soon he'll die. Joshua will take the lead of the Israelites, and they'll cross into the promised land to begin. To, to take over the promised land. They've just defeated another nation, and, and now Balak, the king of Moab, is, is worried. He's concerned because he thinks that the Israelites are going to take all of the things that, that are good and, and that belong to him and the, and the, the Moabites. So Balaam is hired uh, with money to be a prophet for uh, the king of Moab. Balaam, Balaam is not an Israelite, and he's not identified as a prophet of God. But ironically, God uses him to bless the Israelites multiple times. Uh, this is the story of the talking donkey. Okay, now you know who Balaam is. All right. Uh, Balaam is, is hired by Balak. Uh, he, he hops on his donkey to, to go, and the angel of the Lord stands in front of the donkey, and the, and the donkey starts uh, going off into the fields and rubbing up against the wall and, and doing anything that the, the donkey can to not have to go into and, and be killed, basically, by this, this angel of the Lord. And, and finally, after the third time when uh, Balaam strikes him and hits him and beats him, uh, the don God allows the donkey to, 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 to talk. And he says, why are you hitting me? I'm trying to save your life, is, is basically the, the message that the the donkey delivers uh, to Balaam. So Balaam is, is unable. Balaam is not allowed. Even though Balaam is not a prophet of God, God does not allow Balaam to curse the Israelites. Instead, whenever he talks about the Israelites, he actually ends up blessing them. He actually ends up saying good things about them. But that doesn't mean that Balaam is, is on the side of the Israelites. Balaam has been hired by Balak to somehow curse or destroy or defeat the Israelites. So they come up with a new plan. Uh, and this new plan is not to, to curse because God simply isn't going to allow him to do that. Uh, Balaam and Balak seek another answer to the problem of the Israelites. In Numbers 25, the Israelites are seduced by the daughters of the Moabites to commit immorality and to worship their God, to worship the God Baal. In Numbers chapter 36 and verse, sorry, 31 and verse 16, it indicates that this, this seducing of the Israelites by the, uh, the daughters of, of Moab was Balaam's idea. It was him that, that presented this idea uh, to Balak. Uh, in, in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 15, it talks about Balaam, and there it says that he uh, 
um, was the, he did evil against the people of God for the payment that he received from Balak. So again, he's doing all this as kind of a, a mercenary preacher, if you will. Uh, someone who you can hire him and, and he'll do whatever he can to, uh, to talk badly about, to prophesy badly about, to curse uh, other people, or even to, to somehow bring about a plan, put a plan into action that will, will be bad for those folks. And, and this is what he's doing here in the Israelite, to the Israelites. In the end, here's, here's the point, here's what happens. In the end, because Balaam teaches Balak, here's what you need to do. You need to put this stumbling block in front of them. You need to seduce them with the daughters. You need to, to encourage them to, to worship uh, your God and to follow your God instead of to follow their God. In the end, because the Israelites make the decision to do that and sin against God, 24,000 Israelites are killed by a plague before God's wrath is quenched. And God's wrath is only quenched with the public execution of those who led in the sin. Lots of death. Lots of, of uh, terrible scenes happen because of what Balaam teaches Balak to do to the Israelites. Now, the Israelites are still responsible. That's why they die. Uh, but, but Balaam is the one who teaches, let's put stumbling blocks in their way. Let's tempt them. Let's put something out there that's going to be very hard for them to resist. So what is this, this teaching uh, that Jesus says that some in the first century city of Pergamum are holding on to? Again, Balaam teaches Balak. We can't defeat them head on. Uh, so we'll put stumbling blocks in their way. He teaches them that compromise leads to conquest. Uh, the Moabites couldn't defeat the Israelites in battle. The Moabites couldn't defeat the Israelites through cursing them because God wouldn't allow Balaam to curse him. But God does allow for there to be stumbling blocks there, just like God allows for us to have free choice today. God allows us to make whatever decisions that we want. And the reality is that there are people out there who are actively, maybe in your individual life, and certainly Satan, uh, in, in his, uh, his will and his desires, and those who, who serve him purposefully or those who serve him not on purpose, uh, put stumbling blocks before us today as Christians. And we have a choice every day whether we're going to be faithful to God or whether we're going to stumble over those things that are on our way. On the plains of Moab for the Israelites thousands of years ago, Balak couldn't conquer the Israelites, again, through battle or through a curse. So Balaam taught him to tempt them, uh, to tempt them with meat sacrificed to idols. How would that be tempting? Meat sacrificed to idols. What have they been eating for 40 years? Quail and manna. So meat sacrificed to idols would sound pretty good to them. We get to eat real meat, not just quail. We've ate quail for the last thousands upon thousands of days. We want something different. We've been eating this, this bread that we don't even really know what it is. We just call it manna. And we've been eating it. So there's something new. There's something different. There's something better. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, the daughters of the Moabite in worship to their God, perhaps, as it was in Pergamum also. But also just the sexual temptation that would be there. In Pergamum, what was the, what was the stumbling block? Again, Satan couldn't conquer the, the Christians through intimidation or suffering or even death. We read about that already with Antipas. So he achieved conquest with Compromise from within. These Christians are surrounded by all kinds of different temptations of different gods to follow. Emperor worship, Greek gods, Egyptian gods, Asian gods. If they, they're, they're encouraged to, to, to not just accept one God, but to accept all of them. Christians in that, in that city would be, it's fine for you to be a Christian. It's fine for you to worship that God, but, but worship this God over here too. This God does good things for us. This God blesses us. This God does good things for us. The emperor provides for us. We need to, to praise and honor them as well. It's a, a very compromising position. It's not so much that they're told they can't worship uh, the God that they believed in. It's that they just needed to worship all the other gods as well. And here we have the Nicolaitans. These would be people who claim to be Christians and claim to have a better understanding of God. And maybe even uh, present this idea. Uh, that in order to, to reach the world, we can't be so different than the world. We can't be so extreme. Because when we uh, cut ourselves off from those we're trying to reach, uh, we, we separate ourselves from them. We can't reach them. So they would present an idea perhaps of instead of cutting ourselves off from them and, and trying to be so different from them, instead we need to become like them. We need to participate in the things that they participate in so that we can relate to them, so that we can have something in common with them and we can have a, a starting point of, of, our, of our studies. Now, in some ways, there's, there's a balance there is the point I'm going to try and make here. It's true 
that we can't totally cut ourselves off from the world. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. We, we have to live in this world. We have to interact with people who are not Christians. God has not called us uh, to go somewhere and to, to just have a community of, of Christians. That's not what God has called us to do. He's called us to, to live in the world and to make a difference in this world. In 1 Corinthians 9, 22, Paul says, I have become all things to all men so that by all means I may, may save some. Uh, God, Paul changed some things about the way he approached people when giving them the gospel. He never changed the gospel, but he, he changed his approach to some people in some ways. So there is a connection that needs to be made. However, the Nicolaitans clearly are unbalanced in this. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 6, in a previous letter, he says to that, that congregation, "...you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate." So while it's true, if the Nicolaitans were to present this idea that we can't cut ourselves off from them because we won't be able to reach them if we cut ourselves off from them. That's true. But they had gone to an extreme. They had gone too far. Uh, Christians in Pergamum may have not recognized that the Nicolaitans um, were not who they needed to be. Who were, they were evil, in fact. Uh, maybe they had questions about them. But by referring to Balaam, Jesus shows that with beyond the shadow of a doubt that these people are not people uh, that Christians should associate with. Let's notice verse 16. He says, Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make more against, war against them with the sword of my mouth. So that there's a, a picture of urgency here. He says, I have this against you, that you have some there who hold to the teachings of Balaam. What does that mean? Uh, that there, there are some people who are there who are encouraging you to compromise. They're encouraging you to, uh, to, to, to bend, the, the, bend the rules a little bit, to, to break your, uh, your dedication to God just a little bit. And, and, and you have to get rid of them. And then he says in verse 16, repent, or I'm coming to you and I'm going to make war against those who believe that way. And I'm bringing my sword along with me. Again, like Rome, uh, like Pergamum, who had the power to, to kill and to execute, God also had that power to kill. And we think back to Balaam in Numbers 31 and verse 8. It says this, They also killed Balaam, the son of Beor, with the son. What was the end of Balaam? He was killed. And he was killed with the sword. And again, there's another reference that if you, we were familiar with Old Testament Scripture as these Christians in Pergamum would, were, when he says, I am the one with the sharp two-edged sword, and then he brings up Balaam, they would think about Balaam dying by the sword. This punishment was extreme. For Balaam, and it would be for the Christians in Pergamum, because God's people are to be extremely different. We as Christians must be people who live a different kind of life. And let's notice, lastly, with verse 17. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, manna, manna and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one else, uh, which no one knows, but he who receives it. So again, as each of these letters ends, uh, to the overcomer, we can overcome whatever situations, whatever uh, circumstances we face in our lives, they were able to overcome, they had the opportunity to overcome, and we can overcome as well. And he offers them hidden manna. Uh, and this would be in contrast to the idolatrous meats uh, that they were taking part of. Uh, Jesus is called the bread of life that leads to eternal life. He's called that bread of life, that, and we know that life leads to eternal life. In John chapter 6 and verse 47. So, so he's offering them, I'm not going to give you meats. I'm not going to give you uh, blessings on, on this earth necessarily. But I'm going to offer you the, the hidden manna. I'm going to offer you the, the manna that will lead for you to, to have eternal life uh, with God in heaven one day. And then it talks about a white stone. And there's a lot of different ideas and not a lot of great answers about what this, uh, what this white stone means. It's not referred to anywhere else in Scripture. And like we said, if we, when we look to the symbolism, we want to look to Scripture and find what we can. Well, in Scripture there's no, no reference necessarily to this white stone. But it, from historical context, uh, here are some things we know. Uh, stones were used in courts uh, when there was a, a jury. Uh, and, and in order to, to vote whether you thought the person was guilty or innocent, you had a, a white stone and you had a black stone. And if you presented the, the white stone, that was your vote of saying this person's innocent. If you gave the, the black stone, that was your vote to say this person is guilty. So, so maybe he, he's offering to them, I'll give you this white stone because you'll be innocent. You'll be uh, able to, to be a part of my kingdom. That's, that's possible. Uh, it says on that stone uh, there will be a new name written on it. 
Well, that's not necessarily anything new, is it? Uh, we, we hear about God changing people's names pretty often in Scripture, right? Abram's name is changed to Abraham. Jacob's name is changed to Israel, even in the New Testament. Cephas' name is changed to Peter. So, a new name is, is not uh, a new idea. Uh, so, when we combine these two pictures, maybe is, is where we get the, the best historical context of, of what it might have been, what it might have represented to these first century Christians. A white stone with a name on it, those were often given to uh, victors of Olympic Games or of some sort of competition. And it was, in some ways, their, their invitation card to a celebration after the Games were over. And only, only the victors were able to come uh, to this special celebration. And they would receive a, a white stone and it would have their name engraved upon it. Perhaps that, would, that is what it means. The, the fact is, we don't know exactly what that means. It's not referenced in Scripture specifically, so we can't know. Uh, but we can look to, to some possible uh, historical things that might point to that. If it is that, here's what it would mean. Uh, that, that Jesus gives us this invitation that when we uh, overcome, we are the victor through our faith in Christ and through His victory over the world, then we're invited into uh, this special event. What is that special event? It's heaven. Uh, we have the opportunity uh, to present this stone with, with our, our new name on it uh, at, at the invitation into heaven. And we get to spend eternity with God in heaven. Let's notice, lastly, some lessons from the church at Pergamum. First of all, this was true for them uh, th- a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, and it's true for us uh, today as well. Jesus has the power to punish with perfect judgment. He has the sword, and the the Word of God is living and active, and it's able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. If you go to hell, you will deserve deserve to go to hell. If you go to heaven, it will only be because of your obedience to Christ. God knows you. You can't hide it from God. God knows everything about you. He knew these, these Nicolaitans. He knew what they were doing, and He knows what we are doing today. We may be able to, to fool our children. We may be able to fool our parents. We may be able to fool our friends. We may be able to, to fool anyone else in this whole world. We may be even able to fool ourselves in some ways. But we can't fool God. Uh, God will judge. Jesus will judge with perfect judgment. Uh, Jesus knows our circumstances and our hearts. He knows what we're going through. Uh, as He knew what the church at Pergamon was going through when, when one, of their, one of their members there died and they were still faithful, uh, he, he commends them for that. And He will commend us for doing the things that we do that, is, that are right. Uh, if we compromise, we must repent or we will be punished. Jesus says to these Nicolaitans and to those who are following this idea, I'm coming to you with my sword. And if you don't repent, uh, then I'm going to punish you. Uh, the judgment will be brought against you. And lastly, partaking of Jesus or being in Jesus, being a part of the family of God makes us innocent and invited into eternity with Him. Christians overcome because Jesus overcame. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For each of these churches, of these seven churches, for each congregation of the Lord's church that exists today, and for every Christian, that should be a comforting thought. Come, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. That's what we are striving to get to, isn't it? Uh, that we, we go through the, the ups and downs of this life, the, the good times and the blessings of being a Christian, and also the difficulties of being a Christian. And we have our hope set on the fact that we will be accepted to be with God eternally with, with Him one day. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, The one who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. If you want to be able to come to Jesus, to, to be with Jesus eternally, you must believe. You must have that faith. Of course, you must repent. Acts chapter 17, 30 and 31. Why do we need to repent? Verse 31 says, Because there is a day that He has fixed when He will judge the world. He will use that sword to bring about the punishment that is necessary for those who are uh, not obedient to Him. Confession. Uh, we also need to, need to have the, the willingness and the strength to confess. And to have the type of confession that the Christians at Pergamum had. Not just a one-time thing. You know, we, we, as, we, as we go through this, maybe at the end of every sermon, for however many sermons you've ever heard, and we go through the, the steps of salvation, maybe you only think of confession as that time when you're standing there in the water before you're baptized and someone asks you. But confession for the, the Christians at Pergamum was, was, was that, but it was so much more. They were willing to confess, they were willing to worship, they were willing to follow God, Jesus, every day in spite of and in face of so many other options and so much other temptation. We need to be willing to confess because confession leads to salvation, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And we need to appeal to God for a clean conscience. 
through baptism. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. What cleanses us, what allows us to, to be that perfect and complete and innocent child of God is our obedience to the gospel, which ends in baptism and continues on through the rest of our life. Uh, in Pergamum, like in all these cities, there were Christians who had difficulties and temptations. In Rock Hill, uh, there are Christians who have difficulties and temptation. Uh, the question is, will you submit to the temptations? Will you bow down to another God? Or will you continue to follow God uh, as we serve Him today, every day? If you're an, not a Christian tonight, uh, please would encourage you to consider that. If you are a Christian, uh, let's challenge each other to remain faithful in the, space of, in, in the face of whatever difficulties might come our way. If you have any needs tonight, I encourage you to come as we stand and sing.